see. Hello everyone, my name is Barbara and I would like to welcome you all to our latest Novage webinar episode. In this week's episode, Essential Maxwell Render Tips and the new version 3.2. Today's presenter, Juan Canada from the Maxwell Render team, will offer speedy tips on materials, interior lighting, multi-light and more covering critical workflow points that many people overlook. He'll also introduce the new Maxwell Render V3.2, which includes speed improvements and new features in many important areas and the entrance into virtual reality. One Canada joined Next Limit to work on research projects, later movie, moving to the newly formed Maxwell Render research team. He holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and a degree in environmental sciences. Outside the office, Juan used to describe himself as an acceptable guitar player, although his skills have deteriorated since the birth of his beautiful children. To try to stop himself thinking about rendering all the time, he's an avid scuba diver and underwater photographer, although sometimes when he looks at how light behaves under the sea, he realizes how much work we have left to do. Not so much, I hope. <laughs> Before we get going, here's an overview of what we do at Novag. See, Novage is one of the largest online stores for um, design software. And um, we offer a huge assortment of solutions that cater to virtually every designer's need. Put us to the test and come visit our webpage at novage.com. Now, here we go. Uh, for more daily software news and limited time promotions, pay a visit to the Novage blog and follow us on Facebook, Google Plus, and Twitter. And coming up in two weeks, in one week, actually next week, Solid Edge, design without boundaries in a multi-cad world. Solid Edge with synchronous technology offers design engineers a new groundbreaking way to design faster with more flexibility. Last but not least, today's webinar is free and is being recorded live. If you want to rewatch this or any webinar episode on our collection, just head on over to Novage's YouTube or Vimeo channel. And now I'm going to stop talking and pass the word and the screen to um, Juan, so um, we can look at you know, the new version of Maxwell. We're very excited. Take it away, Juan. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I hope that you can see my screen. Can you, Barbara? Looking great. OK, great. Well, hi, everyone. Thanks a lot for for attending this webinar. Uh, as you might notice in this first slide, uh, I'm not Dario Lanza, Dario is one of our main specialists and well he got quite ill yesterday and um, well he's recovering but he will not be fully ready until next week so um, I just hope he gets well very soon. Um, well, the thing is that I just came back from Seagraph and holidays yesterday night and I had to <laughs> catch up today with many things and prepare this webinar. So um, luckily Dario is a pretty organized guy and he, he left a lot of materials already done. Um, so, so well, um, this is not an excuse, it's just to, to, to say that if, if you think that I'm missing anything, please do not hesitate in asking and I'll, I'll try to do my best. I also want to say I'm, I'm a developer, I'm not a product specialist, so again, if if there is something that maybe I get too technical or you uh, or you prefer, well, or you have any questions because I'm, I'm just giving you the developer point of view and another user point of view, just ask me and I'll try to to reply and, and to be as good as that you. Okay, uh, the first part of the presentation will be um, uh, an introduction to, to optimization of render times in Maxwell, uh, giving you 10 or 12 best tips. After that, we'll, uh, I will show you what's new in 3.2. And if, if there is time at the end, there will be, uh, well, I'll reply to all your questions, of course, and, and, and maybe I'll have time to show you a few more things that are coming after 3.2 or well. Um, let's start with the tips. Okay, I guess that uh, most of you already know this one, but it's so important. Use real world units. Oh, there's a typo here. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, this is really not an optimization, but this is 
to avoid pessimizations. This is to avoid things get bad. The scale is critical in, in many aspects. First of all, it affects the camera a lot. It affects depth of field. If you don't have the right scale, uh, if, for instance, your model is very big, uh, you will never see depth of field. If your model is very small, it will look like a miniature. Um, also, you might have uh, too much depth of field, and that increases render times a lot. Um, well, regarding this type of field issue, some people, uh, as an optimization, a very extreme optimization, they set the camera lens as pinhole instead of using a, a real thin lens camera and add the depth of field on post processing, which is really fast. You can do that. Personally, I don't like it that much because, well, that kills a, a bit of a, of the maximum quality, but very an optimization sometimes you, you might need. Also, scale is very important for dielectrics, for um, things like attenuation distance, uh, d displacement when you're working in world units. Well, all these things require that your scale is good. And there are other things that are important for scale. For instance, if you think not only in rendering but in the whole pipeline, if you um, if you later or before rendering want to to go to to use a simulation software like a fluid simulator software or solid rigids, whatever. Uh, again, the scale is critical there. So uh, this is again not really a tip, but this is almost mandatory that you should work with real units, unless there is a very strong reason for not doing that. Okay. Ah, this is just an example that if we had modeled this, uh, for instance, in millimeters, that will have a miniature look completely undesired. Thanks, Dan Abrams, for this beautiful render. Never had an emitter behind a dielectric object. This is tip number two. Okay, this is, uh, I will not say never here. I will say that try to avoid that. I wouldn't say never because sometimes you really want to do that. For instance, for achieving this kind of effects, you really need an emitter inside the, the, lantern, the lantern and then a glass here uh, if you want to have some kind of dispersions uh, effects or not. Well, the, at the end, it's all about trying to put as many things as possible between lights and the camera. So if you if you want to 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 get faster render times, just try to avoid that. Uh, that means, for instance, in architecture renderers, try to avoid glasses in windows when they are not necessary, or use architecture glass solutions, something we'll talk later, or um, in any kind of luminaire, try to be uh, well as efficient as possible. Again, sometimes you really want to simulate the whole thing, everything that happens between the light and the dielectric and the camera, and in those cases, it's it's better not to use this tip, but it's something you should keep in mind. Okay, use meters as few with as few polygons as possible, and use realistic light power values. Uh, in Maxwell, there are a few optimizations, and one of them affects two emitters with less than 32 polygons. This is because uh, because of the nature of the of, how, of the Maxwell solver. Maxwell uh, tries to solve well solves the the light transport equation through statistical methods, and that means using a lot of sampling sampling um, uh, sampling methods. And sometimes you have to pick light or other depending on its power, depending on the area, depending on the solid angle or how much is pointing to the camera or the um, and well, evaluation of those emitter masses is critical. So we have applied some optimizations that happen when the number of polygons is very low. Uh, that's important. Okay. Well, this is just an example. The second part of this tip is to use realistic light power values. This is as important as using real units. If you um, are uh, setting an emitter light with a, an emitter with with a very unrealistic, very high or very low um, number of watts, it means that something is wrong. Uh, maybe something is wrong in your exposure, 
uh, and your camera exposure parameters or something is running in the scene scale or there is something else there. In Maxwell, everything should feel real. If in real life you don't need those extreme values, in Maxwell you don't need them either. Also, um, uh, you can use multi-light, uh, a feature that probably uh, all of you know. Um, put all the meters um, at the same value and they are adjusted in post-processing with the multi-light in real time. That will also help you to, to, to find sources of noise, as, as I will explain in, in a later tip. Okay, just more examples of using emitters. I don't know the specific settings of this thing, probably that are you new, but I'm pretty sure that uh, in this Maxwell steam, the, the, the artist that has modeled this scene has used uh, emission units similar to the ones in real life. And same here or here. Okay, number four. On window panes, use architecture glass solution glasses when possible. Uh, for the ones who don't know that architecture glass solutions, what we call SGS, are optimized glasses where that you can use when you just need transparency and reflection, but you don't need the refraction and caustic effects that are more expensive. Um, when you when when caustics or refraction happens, uh, a lot of things happen to rays. They start to divert, uh, and in general, there is more noise. So, long time ago, we implemented a specific type of glass to avoid that. So you can use it in windows, you can use it in well, everywhere where you really don't need refraction. And this is some, something very, very useful. For instance, here, uh, um, this window, uh, maybe you don't need any kind of caustic of refraction there. You just need light passing through the window, and you just need uh, the window reflected here, and that's all. That's all you need. Uh, do not overestimate the, the importance of AGS, and in Maxwell because uh, the, well, the optimization can be really, really remarkable. Number five, never use unrealistic bright materials. Uh, at the beginning it's very typical, but well, it happened more in the old times when people were using low dynamic range render engines that just work in, a, in integer precision instead of floating precision. Um, people used to, well, they, they were used to, to pure colors, like pure red, pure white, blue, pure black. Well, those colors don't exist in real life. Blue, uh, pure 255 white means that everything is reflected, and it doesn't happen in real life. In real life, you always have things like this. You, you, this is not exactly why, this is probably around 220. Um, this is important not only for the final look, this is also important for helping Maxwell to convert to the solution faster because when you have unrealistic high brightness in surface, uh, more bounces happen, and that more bounces means more noise and means uh, uh, problems everywhere. So. Keep in mind this optimization, uh, never use pure colors, never use uh, two extreme values in Maxwell. Keep your materials as simple as possible, number six. Um, well, as it says here, typically you can do pretty much, I would say, 95% or even more of the materials you you need just using one or two BSDFs and one or two layers per material, and one of or two BSDF per layer. Um, personally, we recommend you to use the material assistance. I will open Studio and I will play with Studio more later. But uh, probably you know that since Maxwell three, we we don't have just this. Um, kind of complex UI for creating materials, but you can use what we call material assistants that are these wizards uh, you see here, like AGS, opaque, transparent metal, translucent. Um, when you use them, instead of displaying all the parameters, we are just exposing the ones that matter, and also we are exposing 
presets too. It doesn't mean that internally Maxwell is rendering with a different kind of materials. Actually, if you click to to this button, convert to advance, this is um, showing you uh, the real settings of that material. This is what Maxwell is doing when, when the render starts, it converts to regular advanced materials, all the material assistances. So if you use material assistances, uh, somehow you ensure that you are playing with the right parameters and that's very important for performance too. So that's probably my number one tip with um, when using materials. Start with assistance and go start from this point and go beyond because material assistance minimize the amount of layers and BSDFs you use. Um, well, there's some good news in 3.2 regarding this area because um, we have added some speed optimizations that will happen when you have more than one BSDF. Uh, in some scenes, uh, optimization will be very remarkable, in others will not be that significant, but in general, uh, multi-BSDF materials will be faster. But anyway, I want to insist on the fact that uh, you don't need um, all, well, uh, to, to start adding layers uh, without control. Sometimes people add layers just to add small defects on top of of all the material and at the end you end up with, with just too many when that's not necessary. Uh, well, I'll take this opportunity, talking about materials, to, to, to mention that we have plans to do a very deep cleaning of our Maxwell materials gallery because, uh, well, many of those materials are very good and others are are not, or maybe they were very good in Maxwell 1 or Maxwell 2, but there is a better way of um, adjusting parameters in Maxwell 3, so well, uh, that's a huge project because we have thousands of materials, uh, but we have plans during this autumn to review them all and to put uh, like a next limit approval stamp in the ones that are worth um, so well, that was something I wanted to mention also regarding materials because that will that will affect render time since many people use the gallery as a starting point for making materials. Personally, we'll use material assistance instead of uh, materials in the gallery just because materials assistance are something um, newer. They were ready, they were implemented for Maxwell three. Okay, well, they are other two. Uh, well, this is just an example of a material made with uh, very few layers and BSDFs and the quality is very good. Other examples here, Dario prepared his slide and I really I don't know if he wanted to mention something else. But, well, there's something important here regarding materials also, uh, which affects additive, additive layers and, and coatings. Uh, additive layers are uh, more expensive to evaluate and the reason is that uh, Maxwell needs to preserve energy. Uh, in other words, you you can never get more energy um, bouncing from a surface that arriving to the surface. That's a pretty obvious it's just energy uh, conservation uh, principle. So, uh, well, in real life, when you use it never happens because nature is very wise. But in, uh, in Maxwell, if you just start adding additive layers one on top of other, at the end you can end up with something that reflects more light that it arrives. And in order to avoid that and to well and also to avoid that the user has to take all these things into account and reduce the reflectance of these layers separately, we implemented a, a system in Maxwell 3 to render uh, additive layers um, correctly in without any kind of user intervention. Um, and that is more expensive, obviously, than just not using additive layers. Uh, so just keep it in mind. Use additive layers only when you need them, only when they are a fundamental part of, uh, of your setup. Something similar happens with coatings. Coatings are cool. Sometimes they give you an extra in quality or in uh, feeling that you need. 
but if you don't need them, just turn them off. The reason is that the uh, coatings uh, use a kind of complex uh, uh, mathematical model with uh, expensive equations that obviously uh, they take some time. It doesn't mean that they are render time killer, but they take time. And I don't think I have anything else regarding this point, so, well, okay, I was just talking about number seven, so, okay. This is pretty much what I say. Regular BSDF service is the faster solution, even for plastics. Uh, I want to mention that this is also one of our main areas of research, always. Uh, we always have at least one, two, three guys uh, working on optimization of materials and optimization in general. Uh, so the half of the of the team is is working on improving speed in one way or the other. All these are examples of renders done without coatings or additive layers, and, and where you can achieve extremely good results. Okay, displacement. This is a good rule. You can use on the flight for fire from the interactive engine and pre-translated displacement for final render. That could sound a bit weird, but there is an explanation for that. In fire, you really don't want to make changes that force the engine to revoxelize everything. And the, good, the nice thing of the on-the-fly uh, displacement mode is that it doesn't work with real triangles, but it just generates the geometry around the ray. When, when the ray gets closer to a surface, it generates uh, the geometry on the fly, the displaced geometry, and then when the ray escapes, this geometry uh, vanishes. That's great for avoiding uh, having a very heavy uh, scene file. That's great for saving um, memory also, because you can work with very lightweight meshes, and that's uh, more expensive to render. So. Mm, it's pretty cool when you are in fire because you adjust the displacement once and, and you just voxelize once. But once you go to final render, if you have enough memory, it's better to use a pre-tessellated pre one because you voxelize and then everything is converted to triangles in pre-process and then, uh, well, Maxwell is basically just rendering triangles and, and that's faster, that generating all the display geometry on, on runtime. Okay. On interiors, use invisible meters to help direct illumination. Mm, well, we have a nice tutorial about that in our in our website, uh, well, I'm, I'm not going to waste time with that because you you can you can uh, you will find it easily, and I don't want to run out of time without run out of time without um, talking about 3.2. Uh, but well, basically, uh, you always need to uh, to think how can I help mm, the, the Maxwell. Um, engine to find the rays. How can I help the rays to reach the camera and reach lights? And one way of doing that is just uh, adding uh, invisible meters on, on your scene. There is a, uh, an important detail here that confuses people the first time they do that. When, when you just enable the high to camera flag in a meter, uh, the meter just stops showing up on render, but its shadow is still there. So, well, one way of hiding also the shadow of this meter is to to assign to this meter material to have a BSDF which has an index of refraction of one and pure white transmittance. This is like a, a hack, a way of telling Maxwell, hey, it just ignore this this object and act as is as is as if there was not uh, object at all. So that will be a way of hiding the meters, not only the hiding its shape, but also the shadows that it casts. Uh, as I said, in our, if you just search in our um, online help optimizations, interior optimization tips, you will, you will find a, 
a page where you will see more on this with uh, steam samples that you can download and with well, some uh, tables of speed comparisons. And well, this is um, extra sampling. Uh, extra sampling is something we we released uh, a few months ago with 3.1. Basically, it's a way of telling Maxwell, hey, I want to shoot more rays in this region. Uh, that was actually a complicated development because of the way Maxwell works, making that in a correct way, uh, preserving all the tone mapping and the well, multi-light and resume rendering was actually a bit of a hell, honestly, to implement it. But once that it was finished, uh, we think it's pretty, pretty useful. Um, well, there is a, in our YouTube channel a tutorial showing extra sampling as well. Just keep in mind that the extra sampling can divide your render times by a very good factor, especially when you have um, all the difficulties of the scene are in just on a small part of the frame, and the rest of the rays are just evaluating very simple or, um, surfaces, or they are just impacting with the sky. Maybe that part will clean up much sooner, and you don't need to shoot rays in those parts anymore. The nice thing of extra sampling is that you you can experiment with that, and you can resume it. You can uh, say, okay, I want to render everything to sampling level 10 and just this area or this material ID or the alpha channel to sampling level 15. That's all. It's easy to use and I say that's uh, is something very useful. For instance, in this case, maybe you you will define a, a, an extra sampling area only in these glasses or, well, in the parts or in this light the parts where you really need to avoid noise and you will forget about the rest because the rest will be much cleaner uh, sooner, maybe in sampling level 12 or so, everything will be clean except those small areas. Okay, um, this is the part about render times reduction. Um, I will quickly go to talk about the um, 3.2. Because otherwise I'm going to run out of time. Um, I must say this is the first time I do a webinar, so <laughs> I'm not sure I'm uh, very good at uh, calculating time, so I, I will do my best. Uh, first, I will show everything in studio. I'm very sorry. As I said, I'm a developer. I'm not a, a product specialist. And I, it, I didn't have time to uh, install everything in this machine, and I'm not a Maya expert, so I will show, or a Rhino expert, or a SketchUp expert, or whatever. So I will show everything in Studio as as probably you know, pretty much all the functionality that you see in Studio is also available in plugins. So everything I'm going to show here should be available in all the plugins in 3.2. Okay. Also, some of uh, these features, oh, these 3.2 features are not implemented in plugins yet. They are doing it right now. We aim to release 3.2 in late September and some plugins are still missing of, uh, of some things. But the core development is already finished. Okay, I will start with uh, some speed comparisons. Um, subsurface optimizations. This is um, okay. this is um, Maxo 3.1 and this is Maxwell 3.2. Uh, the difference is very remarkable. Okay, one and two. One and two. I'm going to re repeat it a few times so you can see the difference, especially in the ear and nose. Um, uh, this is a very important optimization that uh, personally I think that this is the biggest highlight in 3.2. Even if this is not as sexy as new features, that's very important because soft surface scattering is everywhere and is no question one of the hardest things to render in an unbiased way. So, so well, uh, we we put a lot of efforts on, on doing that. And more correct because it's also more correct. You will see uh, uh, some changes in color too because uh, scattering color is um, is calculated in a more correct way now and it's also faster. So in the same uh, sampling level, you just will have less noise. Okay, I'm going to move quickly to other features now because we will, you will have time to to watch more about these uh, new features uh, very soon when we start posting these things on a, on a website. Nested dielectrics. Um, 
Okay, I'm going to show you a comparison with between Maxwell 3.1. This is what you see on the left, and in the right you see Maxwell 3.2. What's going on here? Well, well what's going on is that um, there is a fundamental problem on rendering in computer graphics when you have two surfaces that collide that uh, that are exactly in the same place. Sorry, I'm going to look for. Okay. I was looking for this diagram. What happens when you model something like this? What, what happens is that uh, a computer really doesn't know what to do here. Uh, because if you leave a gap, that gap will be filled with air. And if you fill the gap with air, you will have an effect. You will see an effect that doesn't happen in real life. Because in real life, there is no air there at all. So actually, you will see a lot of uh, something that we call total, well, no, we don't, um, that everybody calls total internal reflection, T-I-R, uh, and basically it means that more light is reflected than is old. So what is happening now, well, okay, this is another way of exp uh, explaining the gap, is that you can model things in such a way and assigning different priorities to these materials, Maxwell will render this exactly as you see in the right side. This is very easy to use from the user point of view. There is just one more parameter per material. I'm going to open a very small scene that I did 30 minutes ago. Sorry for the low quality. Uh, it's just a couple of spheres. Um, the, the one on the left has water and the one on the right has also water. They are exactly the same. When you render this by default, it will try to do its best here, but um, that will work exactly as in 3.1, uh, depending on on what the ray is doing. If the ray is coming from the left to the right or the opposite, it will it will try to to do its best, but it doesn't happen in real life. In real life, you don't in real life you don't have a point where two materials are existing at the same time. So what happens now in 3.2? there is a global property in the material called nested priority that really means like the the Q. The, the, the lower this number is, the, the highest is the priority. So let's keep the one on the left with zero and let's change the one on the right to something higher. Okay, you see the difference now. I'm going to go back. This is the incorrect way of doing this. And this is what happens when the one on the left has a, a lower number. Uh, it means that it will prevail. So everything will be rendered using the material of the left until you reach this point. Um, if now I increase the, the priority, again, now they have the same priority, so it will render us in 3.1, and now if I keep increasing this number, you will see the, exactly the opposite effect you, will, you saw there. Well, I'm sorry for the, because I know this thing is very basic, but I will show you uh, better examples here of what happens. This is how it rendered in 3.1, and this is 3.2 using these priorities. It's uh, a huge feature, especially important in animation, because when you have just one still, when you're just rendering one frame, you can try to hack things playing with normal vectors and everything, but that's absolutely impossible in animation. And I don't mean huge VFX animation, any kind of animation, especially when you have things like fluids. Um, well, it was pretty much impossible to achieve in a very great way with 3.1, and now um, it looks uh, much better. Well, this is just an, uh, the first test we did. Sorry for the noise, this is a development test. It was 3.1 and it's 3.2. You just can see the, the huge difference here. Okay, um, I'm going to go faster because uh, I have lots of things to show you. Okay, multi light. Um, I'm going to open a, an MXI file to show you some improvements with made in the multi-light editor. Thanks a lot to Techno Image and Pedro Conti for this MXI. It's pretty cool. I love it. Um, okay, now we have a few uh, sliders here, a few lights. Basically, one of the things we have implemented 
is multi-selection, so you can select more than one emitter and you can play with both at the same time. You see that they don't go exactly the same scale because they have a different range. Uh, if you have emitters with exactly the same initial value and the same minimum and maximum values, they will they will move identically. Um, there are other options now like uh, the, the reset or light, uh, select all, deselect all, so it will make it easier to to just to edit several lights simultaneously. I will now to to save some time. I will show you another feature that is new in 3.2, which is a PSD output. Let's um, let's save this image. For instance, here on the desktop and. And let's save it with a PSD extension. So Maxwell will ask you for the depth. Okay, and it will ask you if you if you want to embed the images. Okay, so now Maxwell supports PSD output. Uh, not only saving manually as I'm doing here, but also you can just uh, uh, Using it as one of the of the formats here, you will see that there is a PSD here. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Okay, the file is saved. It's probably here. And if we open it in Photoshop, okay, you will see. Okay, have the, You will see all the layers here, the, the, and you you can see one layer per light and also the, uh, the channels. In this case, we have the material ID enabled and, all, and, and the render channel enabled, and then you have all the lights separately. So, well, that's, uh, that's very handy for Photoshop users, who many of you are, so I hope you like it. Okay, next one. Okay, I'll go in order. Assets reference. Uh, this is one of my favorite, actually. I'm gonna actually I'm gonna create a scene. This one is okay. Um, this is started as a, a new workflow proposal for uh, Rhino users from Macintosh. Just some of you probably Rhino users know that McNeil has released a version for Macintosh, but there is not an SDK yet, so we cannot have a Maxwell plugin there. So what we've done is to to create a new file extension. That is basically a, a, a reference, uh, what we call a, an assets reference thing. So, well, let's let's create another thing from the scratch better. And as you, as I told you, that should be available in all the plugins. Let's create an extension object, and it will be an asset reference. An asset reference means uh, um, that you just pick any file name, and we support a huge amount of of formats. Just look all the formats we support: OBG, FVX. Collada, Blender, 3ds Max, um, Lightwave, Modo, even some game engine formats, um, well, Unity, Unreal Engine, well, lots of them. So, well, basically, you just uh, you just pick any any external object, like for instance this one. And you will see that here. You say, okay, there is no magic here. I'm just importing an OBG inside the studio. Uh, you already supported that in previous versions. Well, this, it's not exactly that. Uh, now we are really not importing the mesh in the studio. We are just referencing this. And in render time, this is uh, this is converted into a Maxwell object. That means that you can have an application like Rhino, 3ds Max, Maya, or Blender, whatever, open. And you can work with um, with both applications at the same time. So any any change you do in Rhino, for instance, you export it to an MX to an OBG file, and Max will automatically reflect the changes. You don't need to re-export an MXS file, and you don't need to embed it again in the scene, and you don't need to do anything like that. Also, when working with OBG files, um, we support we have a MLT. Support MLT is uh, the the system that OBG the OBG format uses for uh, keeping material assignments. 
and we are doing the same with Alembic that is in the list of support formats too. As I said, we'll, we'll publish all the, the list of support formats here too, but as I told you, then there are a lot. Okay, channel separation, as you know, in Maxwell, okay, I'm going to open another thing. Mm, this one. In Maxwell 3.1 and older, there was uh, a drop down list here to say which channels you wanted to render diffuse, reflections, or diffuse um, yeah, and reflections are, and everything together. Now we have more options here. So basically, you can render. I'm going to allow the resolution to go faster just to show you how this thing works. You can just render everything. Sorry for the noise, I'm stopping this. And you can just render the fuse component. Okay, not very sexy, but you can render the gas reflections. Okay, and so on. So, well, what we have done effectively is separating reflections and refractions, and that means that you can apply, apart from all the artistic um, purposes that you might have, like, uh, okay, I just need refractions and I want to do something special with them, that also means that you can separate refractions and scattering um, and apply a denoiser to this specific pass instead of applying it to, to everything. And that can be a very huge time saver also, because now you can apply a denoiser without affecting reflections. Okay, still 20 minutes, I think. I have time for everything. Grass Glow, well, I don't know how many of you used um, Maxwell Grass, um, but basically now it is possible to select the the direction of a uh, um, adjusted or the growth direction so it doesn't grow always um, towards world y or towards the normal vector but you can blend between those two so in, in this kind of vertical triangles you can have something in the middle uh, I will show it to you with a small example because it's really much more easy to explain Grass go. Okay. Again, this is not very beautiful, but yes, it's a good idea. Okay, this is a, a sphere with some grass, and by default, the growth towards y is set to zero. It means that we are just using the normal vector. Its blade is growing, uh, and uh, the direction of its blade is determined by the normal vector of the triangle where it where it belongs. If we change it to 100, all the blades will have initial direction pointing towards or Y. But now we can have something in the middle, something like this. Okay, and that means that you can achieve, um, sorry, uh, this kind of effects quickly. There is another diagram here that shows you the same idea. Okay, next thing. Uh, Maxwell scatter overlaps, I don't want to spend time on this, but now in the Maxwell scatter options there is one that says remove overlapped and when you enable that one uh, it will it will remove uh, overlapping. We are still working on this one to avoid uh, too many uh, remo removals, but uh, basically uh, this is very useful when you want trees and you want to that the final render uh, does, doesn't have any kind of intersection. Next, uh, real, well, about real flow, um, if well, you know real flow is the product we we release here. I just want to mention that in the last version of real flow in 2015, they have completed uh, they have made a complete integration of Maxwell Insight. So if any of you Okay, sorry, I'm going to remove the, the music. If any of you has to render fluids, um, now you can do everything inside RealFlow. This is not just a fire, this is not just a fire viewport, but now you have everything inside. Um, rendering fluids is, is very easy, actually. For instance, this noisy but cool render has been done, done by 
one of our developers with no rendering skills. That's me. I don't have any rendering skills either. Uh, just look at the result. It's, it's pretty good. You just apply a water material and that's all. So, well, I wanted to mention uh, that this is not really part of 3.2 because this is part of RealFlow, but since it was released just a couple of weeks ago, I thought it was good to mention that. Reflectance channel. There is a new channel here in the list, as you will oops, probably see here. Reflectance. And basically what it does is to, to render past where global illumination doesn't affect at all. Okay, uh, some of you will will say, well, well, and why is that? What's what's the use of that? Well, it's just for very specific cases. But sometimes you, for instance, want to hack uh, real luminaires, and you want to or something that is not affected at all by global illumination, and you say, okay, I want this specific color here, or I want uh, to fake a light. Uh, well, we, well, sometimes this is called self-illuminated textures, which is uh, basically saying Maxwell, hey, don't affect this, just use the, the regular color. As you, as you see, this is not only happening with plain colors, but also with textures. You see this texture on the right side is not affected by illumination at all. Okay. Uh, I already talked about this one, and stereo lenses is the, the final one I was going to talk here today. Uh, again, it, I, I was working in another scene, but it's, uh, I didn't have time. But basically now, in Maxwell, you can render different stereo lenses, like the ones you see here. Fish eye, stereo eye, and well, the way they are implemented is just in, in all the plugins will be pretty much the same. In the, where you select the thin lens, uh, pinhole, where you select the lens type, all those options were available in 3.1, and now you have another two, lat long stereo and fish stereo. They are very suitable for stereoscopic purposes. Basically, when you select one of them, for instance, fish stereo, uh, you have some parameters here, and one of them is the eye. Well, I'm sorry, this is thin. It's not, uh, I need to work on the depth of field and everything to, to so something beautiful shows up, but basically you just select the the eye you want to render, uh, the separation between the eyes, uh, field of view. You can uh, have a texture for the separation uh, and a few more things that will they will be included in the documentation. Those parameters are based on standard stereo lenses. This is not something that we have invented. We have just implemented uh, standard stereo lenses. Okay. Um, well, I think this is pretty much it. I also wanted to mention that uh, we have worked a lot in the new network manager for 3.2. Uh, actually, we are using the, net, the new network manager internally all the time now. We are not using the old one at all. Uh, it's much more stable, and some of our testers are using it too. And, well, it will be available for Macintosh as well, because there were problems with the new network system in 3.1 in OS X. Um, so, well, I, I just wanted to to remind that this is um, that this is uh, another improvement that would be very welcome for you. Um, I think it's better to leave time for questions now. So, thank you, you thank you, Juan, okay. for being your first webinar. Wow, you did deliver. <laughs> um, Thanks. Yeah. Dario would be very proud of you. Um, question came in, and uh, Jana backstage did a great work answering most of them. Uh, we still have some for you, so I'm going to assign one to you, and I'm also going to read it. So we'll read it side by side. Sure. If you, let me know if you got it. So Simon asked, "Is the GPU engine still under development?" I read the previous uh, statement you made that the GPU memory was limited still, but couldn't become an hybrid engine like others are? Uh, well, it's funny because um, we just had 10 minutes left, so I had to to choose between showing you the GPU engine or um, asking if you had questions. And I picked the second one because I, I, I appreciate the time you spent here. But maybe you prefer to see the GPU engine <laughs> instead. <laughs> OK. so. Uh, can you still see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. I'm open a prototype. This is not part of, uh, of 
of 3.2, sorry, but this is something we are still working in. But uh, I saw it in, uh, to some people in SIGGRAPH, and, and I think it's fair you, you also see now. Uh, it's still very basic, but as you see, um, it's already integrated in Studio. I'm going to increase the quality a little bit. I'm a bit worried about um, the effect because when you see that through video streaming, probably the speed is not as good as I would like. But okay, this is rendering using the GPU now. I know this is thing is very basic because this is just something we are doing for um, internal development. Uh, but I. Uh, as I said, this is still under development. Uh, well, as you can see here, there are still out of gamut issues. We need to work more in the Fresno side. Some features are still not supported, like uh, subsurface scattering. Uh, we are still working on glosses, but the thing is that it's fast and it will be completely integrated in Maxwell. It will be uh, just another option in the render options. As you can see here, quality production draft, GPU draft. Actually, we probably will remove the draft work because our aim is that at the end you can use the GPU also for final renders. So oh, this is pretty much it. I can even open other scenes that are a bit more sophisticated. Um, okay, yeah, for instance, this one. I could talk about the GPU for like an hour, but we have run out of time, so probably it's not the time. Uh, and increase the quality. I'm not surprised it hasn't crashed yet. Okay. Okay. Um, sorry. Well, you see this kind of small issues. Oops. Well, you can edit materials. You can work exactly in the same way. Let's just change the roughness to zero. Okay. It's, you see these kind of weird things that happen sometimes with GPUs. This is what we are working in now. Okay. I just wanted to. Okay. To edit this material. Okay, so now we have here a pure mirror in the yellow ball, and if I change the roughness, we have a pure Lambertian diffuse material. Okay, not very fancy, but you can take a look. This is the GPU thing is not um, something we are just talking in the theoretical plane. This is something we are working in a lot. By the way, um, as I said, I'm a bit worried about the the performance of the video streaming, but it feels fast even in this. Um, in this car that is not really a very good one at all. It cost me less than $200 like three years ago. So I'm, I, okay, it's a GTX 250. So we are not talking about a super fancy car. I would love to test this in a Tesla or something like that. We have just um, tested that in G-forces. Okay, I hope I just uh, replied to your question. I hope the, yes. the people have seen that happy. Yes, I think so. Also, there were a couple of questions um, okay. about uh, uh, Vectorworks. Uh, this, people say we really need a plug-in for Vectorworks. <laughs> okay, is, is that going to happen? Uh, for us, uh, the main bottleneck for developing a plugin is to find the right developers for doing that. We need people with very high development skills and also we need people who are experts on the platform from the user point of view and they can understand the users. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't succeed with Vectorworks in the past where we were actively looking for, for, for good developers for carrying on with this development. If any of you uh, not about a good vector wars developer, please let us know. We will keep searching. Okay, we put the word out now. Uh, great. Does Maxwell work with X particles and turbulence field? Uh, X particles, are they X gen? Uh, that the extension of Maya? Do you know that? I'm not sure. Timothy, okay. if you want to, you know, get back to us what? with this. Um, but I I have no idea. I, it could be. It could be. Um, uh, well, if if this is section that is a, an extension, a, pl a plugin for Maya, we are working on that connectivity. Yes, hopefully we'll be ready soon. It's just the API is a bit incompatible with Maxwell, and we have to do some changes in our side. Okay, and tell us again when will the beta of Maxwell 3.2 be released? Ah uh, well. The beta, the beta will be released yeah. very soon. 
okay. hopefully next week the public beta available for our customers and uh, the final release it depends on how stable the beta the beta is but we we aim for a release at late September so you will you will have access to these all these things very soon great uh, one another question is um, if, for example, environment behind glass object will be moving as the head will rotate as in reality, because center of that rotation is not in left or right eye, do you know what that? Uh, could you repeat the question? I think he's talking about the stereo I, lenses. I think so. So I will, first of all, I will assign the question to you so you can read it. Um, okay. I wanted to ask if example environment behind glass object will be moving as the head will rotate as in reality. Oh yes, yes, absolutely, yeah. Okay. I need to do some tests actually, that's a good question, but yeah, I, I don't see any reason it doesn't. Okay. Um, are there any plans to enhance the GUI for high DPI displays? Um, Yes, there are plans. We talk about that on CGraph. We use some third-party libraries called Qt that maybe some of them know uh, for um, displaying windows, and, and we're in conversations with them to do that. Yeah, that, that I cannot, I cannot give you a date, uh, but it's, it's something we are, we need to do at some point because high, high display screens are are there, and we need to. To improve the current situation. Yeah. And are there any plans for a ZBrush plugin? We were working on a connection with ZBrush for a while, but uh, apparently Pixelogic they are changing the API and they are going to change the policies to to connect to ZBrush, and this is still a bit unclear. Uh, which renderers will be allowed to do that and which will not. Or uh, I would love to give you a, a more accurate answer on this, but it, it doesn't depend on us too. All I can say is that we are into conversation with them, and if we can, we will. And also this asset extension that I have shown you, that will be a great way of having a, a live connection between Seedbrass and and Maxwell because you could work with an OBG and Alembic or whatever and you can work in both applications at the same time and have a, a Maxwell instance open using the interactive engine and while you are working in Seedbrush you will see the changes in, in Maxwell. Actually the Seedbrush um, SDK was doing something similar under the hood so far as far as I know. Cool. Uh, is there a skin material? Uh, well, you can do skin with Maxwell now, uh, but we don't have material assistant for skin material. That's one of our priorities. Uh, trying to improve um, skin rendering in the same in the next uh, in the next releases. That's not being easy at all. Uh, doing that in an unbiased and efficient way. So yeah, you can, there are many renders of Maxwell with. with um, uh, skin, but yeah, we don't, we don't have a, a material assistance for skin like the ones you have for other things. We will. Okay. Uh, we will try at least. Okay. Can you show hair and particles with a mirror material? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I I didn't talk about that one. Sorry. Mm. Okay, I can't now because there's just two minutes left, but I promise we will try to show you something soon or let me check if I have any scene. Let me check if quickly I can find something uh, where I have particles. I think I have particles somewhere. Maxwell drive scenes. Maybe, maybe I have particles here. Okay, these are particles. Let's create an emitter and let's put it into the particle thing. Okay, this is very black. Probably we need just to put them. I have no idea of the scene scale, so probably I'm doing something very. Okay, I start to see something. Let's switch off the sky. Okay, you get the point, I think. I don't understand exactly why I'm. 
um, in all these paths, but I don't know the scene. Maybe this is modeling kilometers. I have no idea. But anyway, you can see some some particles emitting here. You just saw that you just need to apply an emitter materials. Okay, I didn't have any scene ready for that. That was fast. Um, I'm very surprised. <laughs> wow, you are prepared. <laughs> so uh, well, <laughs> I, was, I was very lucky. Uh, it, will, it will not happen again. <laughs> I'm not that lucky usually. I want to ask you just one last question, okay, before we wrap it up. Can nested so, give result as Boolean union or uh, only That's a yeah. very good question. We have done some experiments on that. Let me check where are they. Okay. This is the secret folder. No. Uh, mm, I don't have any render here with that, but the, the, the answer is, okay, yeah, I have this one. It was done rendering with nested dielectrics. Uh, so the answer is yes, but it's something that came for free, and we are still thinking on the consequences and our, on the limitations. So the answer is that uh, officially no, and officially yes. It's perfect. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much, Juan. I um, will have to take the screen back from you, and I do apologize okay. for that. <laughs> no, no, it, this was so entertaining. Um, I, I would like right. to thank everyone uh, for joining the webinar from the Novage team. And uh, also, I want to remind everyone to visit our webpage at novage.com, where you will find um, Maxer Render and also RealFlow, since you talked about it. Um, Novage is the best way to buy design software online. For information um, on the latest specials and new releases, join the Novage network on Facebook, Google Plus, or Twitter, and subscribe to the Novage blog, where, by the way, we'll probably post a, um, uh, a blog with all these great tips that you, uh, you know, described in this webinar. We'll probably write a little blog post with all the lining, lining them up so you will never forget them. And uh, don't forget that the next week's webinar is about Solid Edge, design without boundaries in a multi-cut world. And thank you again uh, for attending and to watch today's webinar or previous one. Check out our Novag YouTube and Vimeo channels, our webinar playlist as webinars for every software taste. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, thank you so much, Dario, for stepping in and uh, on such short notice. Um, you did a great job, and thank you to Jana from the, the you know Maxwell team for working hard backstage. And um, goodbye to you and your beautiful children. <laughs> bye, Juan. Uh, I, know. <laughs> I, I play guitar even worse. Uh, we need to operate that by. Actually, I have to, and this is even worse. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for for your attention. I'm glad to be here, and I hope that uh, you didn't miss the Rio too much. No, no, it was great. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Barbara. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.